Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for our January Coast to Coast Prostate Cancer Support Group meeting presented by Prostate Cancer Foundation BC and our support initiative, Prostate Cancer Support Canada. My name is Maya and I work in support services with Rochelle at the foundation and PCSC. Um, I'll be moderating this meeting today and Rochelle may pop in, but she's having some problems with her connection. So she's here, um, but she's probably just gonna be watching today. And um, if you need anything during the meeting, please feel free to share, um, to send a chat and I'll do my best to answer it. We are very pleased to have Dr. Philip Cohen here joining us again today to talk about the role of theranostonics in nuclear medicine in prostate cancer. Before I turn it over to him, I'll just go over a few important housekeeping items. Mics will be muted during the presentation with Dr. Cohen, um, but please feel free to send questions via the chat should anything come up during his talk. If you choose to send your questions via Zoom chat, we will ask your questions for you during the following Q&A period in the order that we receive them. You also have the opportunity to unmute your mic and ask your questions yourself if you would prefer. After the presentation and Q&A, we should have time to move into our support group meeting and sharing sessions in the breakout rooms you chose when you registered for the meeting. Please note that the sharing portion of this meeting is strictly confidential and any personal information that is shared here today should not be shared outside of this group. On that note, the first half of this meeting will be recorded and available on our YouTube channel and our website, but the recording will be shut off during Dr. Cohen's present after his presentation during the Q&A to encourage free and open discussion, as well as to protect the privacy of all participants. Finally, an important reminder that the facilitators, moderators, and participants today do not provide medical advice. Rather, we are all here to share experiences and to support one another on our journeys with prostate cancer. As always, this, this of course means that the opinions and information that are shared at support group meetings do not replace the advice of a medical professional, and you should seek the advice of your healthcare provider or healthcare team before pursuing any new treatments or regimens. So here's Dr. Philip um, Cohen's intro. Dr. Philip Cohen is the Division Head of Nuclear Medicine at Lionsgate Hospital in Vancouver, British Columbia. He is the past chairman of the Diagnostic Accreditation Subcommittee for Nuclear Medicine of the British Columbia Medical Association and the BC College of Physicians, member at large at the Canadian Association of Nuclear Medicine and a clinical professor, professor at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Cohen has numerous publications and is a member of the editorial board of the Iranian Journal of Nuclear Medicine. He's also a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in Nuclear Medicine and the American Board of Nuclear Medicine. Dr. Cohen is a pioneer in nuclear medicine in Canada and the usage of 3D imaging techniques to improve diagnosis of bone disease and injury in collaboration with the Medical Imaging Research Group at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Cohen has been involved in clinical research trials of new radiopharmaceuticals. To that effect, he was the first recipient of a research grant from the Lionsgate Hospital Foundation, one of several peer-reviewed awards that would follow. So with that being said, I will pass it over to Dr. Cullen and he will begin his presentation. I'm hoping that you can uh, see my screen. Yeah. And, uh... For those of you that aren't in uh, British Columbia or in Vancouver, uh, this is a view of the North Shore Mountains. And uh, you can see my cursor. This small building is Lionsgate Hospital. It's a community uh, hospital, uh, recently affiliated with the University of uh, British Columbia. It's been part of the uh, university training program really for the, about the last 15 years. Uh, I'm uh, head of nuclear medicine at the hospital and have been here for about uh, 40 years. But I'm also a consultant to a uh, private clinic uh, in the past uh, two years called Initio, uh, which I'll discuss at the end of my presentation and you'll see why it fits in. So I'm uh, gonna talk about theranostics, which is a new buzzword in nuclear medicine. Uh, it comes from therapy and diagnosis using uh, essentially the same agent for both imaging and treatment. And uh, a professor in Germany, Richard Baum, uh, described it as we have the ability now to see what we treat and to treat what we see. So 
in the century theranostics is a nuclear technique to visualize and eliminate cancerous cells. This, this cartoon uh, really uh, describes it, uh, I think, best. Uh, we have uh, a tumor cell. This can be a prostate cancer tumor, but it could be breast cancer or any cancer. Uh, we have a receptor that's being expressed usually on the surface of the uh, cancer cell. And we basically target that with a molecule that will bind to that receptor. And uh, we attach to it a radioactive drug. Uh, the radioactivity can be used for imaging when it gives off an X-ray called a gamma ray, or it can be used for killing the cancer cell when it emits a solid uh, particle, either a, an electron called a beta particle or a helium nucleus called an alpha particle. It's a new type of cancer therapy. We traditionally had surgery, radiation therapy from outside, chemotherapy. Uh, there's newer uh, treatments now using uh, the patient's own immune system using immune modulators called immunotherapy. And we're now adding theranostics, uh, although it's been used uh, really in the past 80 years uh, of research. So what we have is a guidance system, which is, can be a small molecule of peptide, uh, which is what we'll probably just be describing uh, uh, mostly in this presentation, but it can be an antibody that's engineered to a receptor on the cancer cell. And then we have a radioactive payload, which is currently either lutetium-177 or actinium-255. Lutetium is a uh, beta emitter and emits electron. Actinium-255, that should be 225 actually, uh, emits a, an alpha particle or helium nucleus. So in order to determine if the target is present, we have to use a radioactive imaging payload first. And those uh, radioactivities are usually technetium-99 or fluorine-18 or gallium-68. You don't have to remember any of those. Just remember that we use either a radioactive destructive payload or an imaging payload. Now, the types of radiation that I've been describing uh, are relative in their penetrance. And the gamma rays are, behave like an X-ray and they can go through human tissue, they can go through aluminum and they're usually stopped by lead. Beta particles are uh, electrons and they're more uh, penetrating than uh, alpha particles, but less penetrating than gamma rays. And they will go through to a certain depth of uh, skin, but they'll be stopped by aluminum. Alpha particles are much larger particles. They're nuclei of helium atoms, and they're stopped by skin. But as you'll see there, despite the fact they don't penetrate very much, they're very destructive. Uh, I always show this because this was the first real Theranostics uh, presentation that really stimulated uh, the whole field. And it was presented in 2018, so about five years ago in Philadelphia. This was coming from uh, Melbourne, Australia, by a, a researcher there named Michael Hoffman. And I think it's very striking what he's done because he showed patients with prostate cancer before and after treatment with lutetium-177, now, now known as Pluvicto, and now approved in Canada. And these were his most dramatic patients. So everything that's cancer, you can see is in red. And what we have, and at the bottom are the prostate-specific uh, antigen numbers, the PSA numbers and blood tests. And this is before and after treatment. And almost all of these patients there is a near complete response to the therapy. Now, when we all saw that, we of course, certainly I thought this was a cure, but in all of these patients, there was a relapse. So this was a significant remission, but it was not a cure. We uh, basically targeted uh, the uh, radioactivity 
to this target, prostate, prostate specific membrane antigen. It's not the same as PSA, which is prostate specific antigen. This is a membrane antigen that's expressed on the surface of cancer cells. And there are a number of imaging targets. Uh, the one that we are uh, probably going to see used most often in uh, the next several years is gallium PSMA 11 for imaging. Uh, there was a, a peptide uh, similar to, uh, it was a monoclonal antibody. Uh, it also targeted this, but intracellularly. And it was uh, brought out about 20 years ago. It did not work particularly well. It worked, but uh, gave very poor images and was quickly abandoned, unfortunately. The gallium PSMA has uh, really revolutionized, I think, the diagnosis of prostate cancer. These other ones, I don't think we're going to see anytime soon in Canada because they're going to be very expensive. The reason that and PSMA currently is not, uh, with the gallium, is not cheap, but I think it has potential to drop significantly in price because PSMA 11 is off patent. All these other compounds are patented. And, as a result, they're going to be horribly expensive for the next little while. So uh, theranostics using PSA, and again, it's not, PSMA is not PSA. PSA is a protein or a peptide that's broken off from the cell and circulates in the blood. This is a membrane antigen that's expressed on the surface of the cancer cells. Here's the, uh, this little bar is, the antigen that's going out from the cancer cell, from the prostate cancer. We target a radioactive complex. In this case, it's uh, 617, which can be loaded with lutetium. Uh, the lutetium uh, binds to it and destroys the tumor cell. Now, this isn't a new thing. We've actually been using this in nuclear medicine for about the last 50 years. Uh, for thyroid cancer. And the reason that we were able to use it is thyroid cancer and the thyroid gland actively bind radioactive iodine so that we can use a tracer dose, low dose of I131 or I123 to image the cancer. And then we can target it as long as it's expressing the normal uh, iodine receptors and most thyroid, well differentiated thyroid cancers do that. And this was the first patient treated in uh, 1943 when he was very advanced. And this is him after. And we've been treating thyroid cancer with radioiodine for as long as I've been in nuclear medicine, so roughly 50 years. This is a patient uh, showing the uh, thyroid cancer. Almost everything you see is uh, cancer cell. This is uh, normal uh, urinary urine ex excretion in the urinary bladder, so this is normal. But almost everything else you're seeing except in the face, which is salivary activity, is cancer. And uh, this is after one year of therapy. So we've always had a really good treatment for advanced thyroid cancer, uh, our first theranostic compound. The next compound was uh, targeted at uh, a, rare, a rare, fairly rare tumor it's called neuroendocrine tumors. This is the tumor that killed Stephen Jobs, the founder of Apple. And uh, it's been a, a available in Europe since about 2010. We used a, a, a different beta emitter, yttrium 90, but that was uh, discovered to cause quite a lot of toxicity to kidneys. So lutetium was then developed for the treatment of these neuroendocrine tumors. And this is a, a metastatic insulinoma. It's a neuroendocrine tumor that uh, secretes insulin. This patient has extensive involvement of the liver with cancer. And after several therapies, the uh, cancer is significantly reduced from the initial cancer. So uh, this is a very effective treatment. And it's been around since about 2010 which is why lutetium is currently available, but you'll see some of the other radioactive therapies, unfortunately, are just now being produced. So again, another patient with uh, CT, you can see these uh, dark areas in the liver and also these 
lighter areas are tumor. And after the lutetium octria taped therapy, the uh, tumors are almost completely eliminated. This was a uh, trial uh, based uh, about five years ago, uh, which looked at survival curves. And uh, these are patients that were just treated with uh, long acting uh, somatostatin. And these are ones that use the lutetium targeted somatostatin against the receptor in the neuroendocrine tumor. And had an incredible almost two year extension in survival. So we now have advanced to having PSMA labeled with both lutetium and gallium. So the diagnostic companion to make the diagnosis of uh, advanced prostate cancer is gallium 68, which is a PET emitter. And uh, this just shows the images of the patient after being given the gallium PSMA, showing that in this patient with advanced prostate cancer, we're imaging uh, all of the uh, cancer, the liver, spleen, and kidneys are at a normal sites of excretion, as are the salivary glands. And this is un particularly unfortunate because this is probably the rate limiting ability of us to uh, really treat uh, prostate cancer more effectively with uh, uh, the uh, alpha emitters. This is uh, basically a, a less than uh, ideal image following a treatment of this patient's same patient, but being treated with lutetium PSMA. Lutetium gives off a gamma ray, so we can actually image it after therapy. And you can see that the, this patient, although the arms are down, the binding of the lutetium is to the same uh, targets, PSMA targets as uh, the cancer. So we haven't been really using PET very often in prostate cancer until now. It's been used in almost every other cancers, and that's because the main PET imaging agent, uh, which is used in almost every other cancer, does not bind particularly well to prostate cancer. So here is a technetium bone scan, which many of you have had, uh, looking at uh, whether they're spread into the skeleton. Here's the corresponding PET scan, which hardly shows any uptake in the prostate lesions. But we now have a new scanning agent, the gallium PSMA scan. And uh, it uh, is extremely sensitive for prostate cancer that is moved outside the prostate. It's not ideal, or at least we don't think it's ideal for imaging prostate cancer in the prostate. Uh, ultrasound and MRI are probably still uh, better, although it certainly can help if there's uh, any sort of uh, question as to whether they're seeing uh, prostate cancer or not, but it's not probably a first line test for the diagnosis of prostate cancer in the prostate. But it, CT and MRI cannot see PSMA receptors, and I doubt they ever will. And the reason is while they have much better spatial resolution than uh, uh, our PET uh, tracer, they don't have the same contrast resolution. So the difference between abnormal and normal is much easier to see on a nuclear scan. So this is a CT scan over superimposed, and this is a metastatic uh, lesion in uh, this patient's uh, lymph nodes. So how much better is it uh, PSMA PET than CT? Well, 25% of men who have very high risk Gleason scores, so these are Gleason scores of four plus four, eight to 10, were negative with CT or MRI, and 25% of them were detectable with uh, the PSMA scan. Probably more importantly, men who've had their prostate cancers removed, their prostates removed, and uh, appear to be free or doing well with uh, androgen deprivation therapy, anti-testosterone therapy, if they suddenly see a rising uh, blood test, PSA, they uh, had uh, very often non-detectable uh, 
lesions on CT, whereas 70% of them were detectable at very, very low levels, PSA. And this, these arrows just show uh, spread of the uh, prostate cancer to areas outside the prostate. So it's a bit hard to see this. Uh, I have a better uh, chart in the next slide, but uh, in patients that had very, very low uh, uh, PSA levels, they still have the, the higher bars are the PSMA scan compared to CT. So at very, very low levels, it was much easier to see the cancer spread with the PET scan, not still much better than CT with uh, higher levels of PSA. And even, even with very high levels, there's still more detection. Uh, this just expresses it better. Unfortunately, uh, it's cut off my uh, chart. At very low levels, there were uh, 11 out of 44 seen uh, with the uh, PET scan and only two out of 44. 0.5 to 1.5, 18 out of 27, or uh, versus 11 out of 27 at higher levels. So at every level, it performed better than CT. So because of that, uh, it's now been added, uh, at least uh, from the National Cancer Network in the United States, to new prostate imaging guidelines. And uh, here's a bone scan just uh, for comparison. There are abnormalities in the rib here, and this is the corresponding PET scan. So if you uh, are having a rising uh, PSA blood test and you're not uh, being picked up on the bone scan or the CT scan, then uh, in my opinion, uh, all patients should go on to have a PSMA PET scan. The problem will be where to get the scan. The other thing is now uh, going on to the therapy, what to do when the chemotherapy or the androgen deprivation therapy fails. And this agent was just approved. It was uh, developed initially by a company called Endocyte, but uh, Endocyte was bought out by a Swiss uh, big pharma company called uh, Novartis. And uh, it basically targets uh, the cancer uh, PSMA receptor with lutetium-177. Uh, it's got a fairly long half-life. The gallium-68 uh, only exists in uh, nature for about five hours. This really can exist for almost uh, two weeks. And uh, it's got a fairly low uh, uh, beta path, so it doesn't really go too far outside the cancer cells. And because it was uh, developed for neuroendocrine tumors, there is a commercially available supply, although that has been problematic uh, getting it in the last, since it was approved a few months ago. So here's, uh, again, the first reports were all incredibly uh, optimistic, uh, showing patients uh, with spread of the prostate cancer and most of these lesions in the chest disappearing with two cycles. Unfortunately, they generally showed the uh, patients that had the most striking responses. But here's a patient that was treated with uh, abetarone, Dr. Tassel, after failing. Uh, androgen deprivation than enzalutamide. Uh, this was the uh, scan with the PSA blood level of 967. Went on uh, into a clinical trial with uh, Fluvicto or uh, Lutetium PSMA, had a complete remission, but then recurred, was retreated, uh, stayed uh, the same, had a fairly good response, and unfortunately then had a recurrence and uh, went on to uh, leave death. So this is not necessarily a cure, but it certainly is an incredibly, uh, in some patients, dramatic new uh, effective therapy. So they announced uh, positive results in their clinical trials about a year ago. Uh, it was called the phase three vision trial. This is the trial. It's not as uh, striking as what I showed with the uh, neuroendocrine trial. These are patients that didn't have Pluvicto, and these are the patients that did. 
And they only showed this. Now, these were patients with really advanced near end of life prostate cancer, and it showed only a, about a four month extension. Uh, my feeling is it's better than this, but uh, I'm showing you what the evidence shows. Certainly, some patients have very striking near complete remissions. Not, every, not all patients do, but uh, most patients will see a drop in their blood PSA levels with very little toxicity. There was uh, more than just standard of care, uh, the uh, standard of care being essentially just uh, being on uh, androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, so they did see drops in blood counts. Dry mouth was usually transient because there's uptake in the salivary glands, but there's no real uh, issue with destruction from the beta therapy, the lutetium. There was nausea and vomiting, some renal toxicity. Uh, I think the secondary primary malignancies were not related to the therapy, but I, certainly they, they, they were shown. Most of these patients had advanced cancer with uh, external radiation and other things. So I think this is uh, really an artifact. I don't believe it's true. And uh, the intracranial hemorrhage uh, can't explain, but uh, presumably they were at risk uh, being at likely at an advanced age. Now, the real uh, striking new therapy is with the alpha emitters, actinium. 225 prostate specific membrane antigen. The difference is that the beta particles are more penetrating, whereas the alpha particles are much bigger. Beta particles an electron, the alpha particle is uh, two protons and two neutrons. They have 4,000 fold higher energy, so they're much more destructive. And uh, they will, the alpha just shred DNA if they attach to a cell the beta particle may or may not kill the cell. Uh, again, with this cartoon, here's a, it's attaching a, to a cancer cell. These cancer cells are the blue with the purple nuclei. And the beta particle will attach, but it will destroy some cells, including cancer cells, at a distance. Whereas the alpha particle really only goes one to two cells. It doesn't penetrate, so it tends to kill very locally. It can treat more aggressive cancer. So this is a patient that had three treatments with the Fluvicto, the Lutetium PSMA. Uh, it stabilized the disease, but obviously was not curative. And this uh, image has been shown to almost everybody because this patient, after three actinium uh, treatments, went on to complete remission. And there are lots and lots of these anecdotes with the PSMA, people with extensive disease going on to uh, really complete remissions. Some, something like 10 to 15% uh, on a very small uh, trial coming out of Germany. So there aren't a lot of uh, potential isotopes. The ones that have been used are actinium-225 and lead-212, and to a lesser extent, bismuth. Bismuth actually uh, is a decay product from the actinium. Um, this is the, uh, there have been very few reports. This uh, person at the uh, University of Heidelberg reported on 40 patients. 11 patients were too advanced and didn't uh, continue. They, five didn't have any response. Four, and this is a problem with this therapy, were discontinued because it was destroying their salivary glands. And they had extreme dry mouths, lack of tears, and two didn't survive. Again, these were patients with really advanced disease. But of the 38 patients, 87% had PSA decline, 63% had a PSA decline of more than 50%, and five out of 38 or 30% had a response lasting more than two years, uh, which was much better than a beta or or doxycycline or enzalutamide. There's a new agent coming, but it, I think it's probably only going to be for diagnosis. And this is fibroblast activating protein inhibitor. Seems to bind to all types of cancers, including prostate cancer. The problem is it doesn't bind to the directly to the cancer. It binds to uh, the uh, fibro 
fibrous tissue or scar tissue that's uh, basically uh, surrounding the cancer cells. So the, recurrent, the first reports are not particularly encouraging for treatment, but they are very, very good for diagnosis, including uh, prostate cancer. Uh, it, there's uh, a number of companies that have this in clinical trials, I believe, including a uh, Toronto-based company called uh, Point Biopharma. Um, there's going to be other agents. This is an agent that's for diagnosing and we think for treating breast cancer. So I think all cancers are going to eventually uh, go this route. Uh, this is in Australia. Harvey Turner's the guy with the long hair, and he set up a radio immunotherapy center. We're going to try and set up one at uh, Nisho, which is in Burnaby. The PSMA scans currently are available at, at Nisho, which is in Burnaby, a suburb of uh, Vancouver for those outside of Vancouver. Uh, they're, made a, they're only being made, made available, we think, uh, uh, it, large numbers in March and April, because we have to share a gallium 68 generator with the site in Montreal. So we only get the generator anywhere from one to two weeks per month. Scans are currently quite expensive, 3,200. That's because the generator is uh, charged out at quite a significant uh, price. I think it was 1,700. And then we have to pay for the kits, which are I think another five or 600. So uh, the scans currently are 3,200. We're gonna hopefully, once we get our own gallium generator, that we will reduce this cost, at least we hope in half. And we hope to get it down even further. Um, we're also trying to find, uh, get involved in clinical trials where gallium PSMA may be available for free. At BC Cancer uh, in Vancouver, there, it is free because they've been involved with a uh, clinical trial using first lutetium PSMA, they were part of the vision trial. Um, but there's a new agent, uh, uh, lutetium uh, PSMA, uh, that I believe is coming out from another company. And they've been able to do these therapies, but I believe the clinical trial is ended. The actinium PSMA is not available in the USA or Canada. It's only available in various sites in Germany, uh, in Australia, Israel, or India. But we're hoping we might start our own clinical trial with it in the next 12 months. We've certainly been approached to do it. Um, patients uh, who want to try to get actinium therapies are going to have to travel uh, currently outside Canada. And BC Medical Services will not pay for nuclear prostate scans or therapies. Uh, they're only available at uh, Vancouver BC Cancer Agency with about a one year wait. And I believe their uh, trial is uh, pending or it's certainly limited. Uh, we've uh, established a brand new PET scanner in our facility in uh, Burnaby about a year, 18 months ago. I'm a consultant to it, uh, even though I'm mostly based in Lionsgate Hospital. Dr. Uh, Rob Tarswell is uh, the medical director involved in currently in the scans. I'm hoping to become more involved with the TCM therapies. Um, it's been around for over 10 years as an issue, but it's really been in Vancouver for almost 20 years. Um, the one thing I didn't mention, maybe I did, but I didn't uh, dwell on it, is uh, the Pluvicto is going to be extremely, extremely expensive. It's uh, going to cost about uh, $120,000 for four cycles. Uh, that's thanks to Novartis. That's not, wouldn't be our price. What we would do, that's the Novartis charge to us, $120,000. So uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, that's where we stand now. I think as more agents come around and as the uh, actinium becomes available, I hope to see the price drop. It's going to be double that in the United States. So there won't be, unless you go to India, 
I, I don't believe it's going to be cheap anywhere. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen.